It's been a year since ambulance paramedics were given departmental approval to administer morphine to patients in extreme pain. But legislative processes and bureaucratic red tape means they still haven't received the drug. Ambulance paramedic Jeff Marlborough says this morning's road smash was the last straw. The patient was in excruciating pain and was um, unfortunately forced to endure that for some three quarters of an hour before he could call for uh, medical assistance from an external source. Hunter ambulance officers say the paperwork bans won't affect emergency services, but they will stay in force until they get some action. If the relevant minister and bureaucrats could, be, could have been there this morning and heard this patient screaming in agony uh, before he could uh, adequately relieve his pain, I'm sure that would, uh, that would uh, harden their resolve to get things going. But unfortunately they're just too far removed from the actual uh, people that they're supposed to serve. Okay, that's great. Thanks, mate. Well, was there a problem with that truck or did we get... this afternoon. Students, parents and dignitaries from across the, the state gathered to recognise the 23rd uh, Foundation Day of an agricultural college which now enjoys modest international uh, recognition. To to state Agriculture Minister so Ian Armstrong accepted an invitation to officially open the new facilities. He stressed the importance Special of the technological guests, revolution which affects the day-to-day -day running the of Minister modern agriculture. Spent... This college is so highly adaptable and can adequately cater for the changes of this decade and certainly into the next century. A new After the speeches, time, the Minister formally unveiled a plaque commemorating the federal audience. government's contribution to the expansion, then a tour of the new facilities, especially the computer room where farmers of the future will do much of their early training. Visitors were also invited to inspect some of the work being tackled by the students, as well as ask the young project designers questions about their studies. And how they breed. As removalists shifted the last of the fittings from the Derby Street office, staff members reflected on the consultancy's brief but successful career. The Hunter Employment and Industry Development Scheme was established as a trade union initiative to give the consultancy access to the shop floor during the lengthy process of award and industry restructuring. However, manager Peter Barrack says the funding cuts were inevitable. Well, we're closing simply because of, I think, of a vindictive approach by the state government. Uh, this was set up by a state Labor government prior to the last state elections and uh, it didn't fit into the philosophical aims in terms of industrial relations of the current state government. Uh, so I think there's just a vindictive uh, approach to uh, the whole question. Even so, the scheme pioneered the way for similar moves at a national level. The Hunter scheme is the model for the federal government's workplace resources scheme and Peter Barrack says the closure is only a temporary setback. Once the federal government get into the field uh, and set up their national network, uh, I'm sure that the industry will forget this uh, sorry period and uh, uh, want to see uh, that service provided in the future. How much indication did you have that, um, that your time was...
people to, to enjoy themselves for a couple of days, have fun, to get together, to meet, to entertain themselves. Politicians, officials and beauty queens were amongst those who attended this year's festival, which was kicked off in a multicultural flavour. With the serious business out of the way, it was down to partying the German way, with absolutely everybody getting into the act. I think the, the German community in, in, in Newcastle, Lake Macquarie and the Hunter Valley has very well blended into the Australian uh, uh, society and I am very much impressed indeed by the way this Oktoberfest is being celebrated together between Australians and Germans. Cheers. Cheers. Or should I say Prost? Peter Ryan reporting for NBN News. Problems began at the Mount Thorley coal loading facility south of Singleton. On October the 14th, the company and Miners Federation delegates met to discuss the introduction of a seven-day roster. Both parties agreed to go away and discuss the issue further. Three days later, nine employees who load coal onto trains, members of the Miners Federation, were on strike. On Wednesday, October the 19th, the local coal authority ordered the men back to work, a directive they ignored. The company then applied to have the dispute heard by the coal industry tribunal, David Duncan. Last Wednesday, that tribunal upheld the earlier directive for the men to return to work. Today, they are still on strike. Coal from major Upper Hunter mines is not being loaded, costing 160,000 tonnes a week in lost exports. Mount Thorley Coal Loading Limited is considering sacking the men. Some of the larger feeder mines, such as Wombo, Walkworth, Leamington and Mount Thorley, are considering taking legal action against the Miners' Federation on the grounds of a secondary boycott which is affecting their viability. Last week, the Miners' Federation was reported to have threatened wider industrial action if the men were sacked. Miners' Federation Northern Branch President Jeff Brown was not available for comment today. Martin Drinkwater and Maxine Bartlett were reluctant heroes. They accepted the plaques as a token of ongoing cooperation between the Hunter Hospital and local police. Martin said he had little or no knowledge of weapons when he grabbed the grenade holding the man's fingers around the weapon. Oh, very little apart from uh, watching Vic Morrow in combat when I was a kid. <laughs> and uh, so at that point you realised then that what she had to have a grip on that grenade? I realised it had to be controlled, yes. And Maxine, uh, for yourself, was it, was it a frightening moment? Yes, it was frightening. I had a sense of danger throughout the incident. Um, I'd had some prior knowledge to what was going to occur, not so much with the hand grenade, but that that was a, uh, someone who was potentially unstable and dangerous. And uh, I had a sense of concern for the patients in the hospital and um, my fellow staff, whom I was responsible for at the time. The grenade was later found to have been disarmed prior to the terrifying incident. The ceremony also recognised long service achievements of 24 Newcastle District Police Officers. District Commander Superintendent Russ Cook presented national medals to 15 officers, recognising their 15 years in the force, while nine other officers received clasps for 25 years service.
More than 150 people attended the seminar, many of them police officers and neighbourhood watch representatives. The function was organised to help police identify and solve problems. The neighbourhood watch scheme has been operating now for about three and a half years. More than one and a half thousand groups operate in the state and there are 135 neighbourhood watch areas in the Newcastle district. State coordinator of the scheme, Senior Constable Bill McClurg, says now it's time to re-energise. I think complacency has crept back into some areas. There's nothing to suggest that Neighbourhood Watch is failing. Some areas within the program are struggling a little, basically because they've lost their perception of what Neighbourhood Watch is about. It's about two words on their brochure, community caring. While those at today's seminar obviously care about the scheme, he says there are some who could learn from them. They're rather insular, choose to stay very much to themselves, and while they stand alone, they are potential victims of break and end emergence or whatever else. Whilst they stand together and act as a collective community, they've got a chance. Police say neighbours should work together to stop crime in their community. Exchanging phone numbers in case of emergency, noting habits so to be alert to anything suspicious, and looking out for unusual activity around homes where people are away are all suggested. Stuntman Stuart Campbell, the crazy one, seems to have a burning ambition to set the world on fire. At the Motodrome on Saturday night, Campbell will perform the Human Torch stunt, riding a $10,000 Harley Davidson motorcycle whilst he and the bike are engulfed in flames. Judging from past performances, the bike comes through unscathed. On the track, a $6,000 purse has attracted a top class field of visiting drivers very the ISP East Coast Street Car Classic. The running one Australian car running one Australian champion George Tatnell is racing in a new the car inside and taking on his 17-year-old son, into the Brooke Tatnell, who broke the motodrome 10-lap record in his first in, drive in Newcastle two weeks ago. Smith, Another Smith has of got Australia's top sprint car drivers, Max Domesti, is in the field, along with the Queensland Kelly gang, brothers Bob and John. Also on the agenda are street stock sedans and two Flags were flown at half-mast from state government buildings today in honour of Mr Booth. A state funeral was set to get underway at 11 o'clock, but hundreds had already gathered at the Christchurch Cathedral by the time Mr Booth's coffin arrived just after 10 o'clock. Inside, many of the guests represented a who's who of politics. Those paying their respects included Premier Nick Greiner and opposition leader Bob Carr. Former Premier Barry Unsworth was also in the crowd, along with several other former and current politicians. Federal member for Shortland, Peter Morris, represented the Prime Minister and made a special tribute to Mr Booth, who, with his father, served the Newcastle, Curry and Walls End electorates for a total of 63 years. Former State Premier Neville Rann also reflected on Mr Booth's qualities, saying Mr Booth had been the only member of State Parliament he had confided in when he made the decision to resign from politics. And Mr Rann described his late colleague as a walking barometer of the voting intentions of the population. I must admit that I never called an election and I never called a by-election without first having a talk to Ken Booth because he always seemed to be able to put his finger on where things were going right, where things were going wrong and where the totality of support lay. I know this wouldn't happen now or even with my immediate uh, predecessor, Barry Unsworth, but frequently we would delay by-elections because Boothie would think it just wasn't the right time. And he always, uh, I always heeded his advice. The Bishop of Newcastle, Bishop Holland, also addressed the service, which lasted an hour. Mr Booth held numerous portfolios throughout his career, including Treasurer, Minister for Sport and Recreation, and Minister for Tourism. 
man described as the son of the hunter became the member for Curry in 1960 and in 1968 was elected to the seat of Hall's End, which he retained until his death. He died suddenly at his Glendale home on Monday night. He was 63. Today's ceremony in Lawson Avenue, Woodbury, was the third official dedication of the War Memorial. In 1920, it was erected on Woodbury Road. 54 years later, however, due to subdivision of the area, it was moved to Nylands Lane, one kilometre outside Woodbury. With more land development on the way, the memorial was again moved in July this year, with support from the Department of Veteran Affairs and the Beresfield Lions Club. Today's ceremony was witnessed by returned servicemen from World Wars I and II, Korea and Vietnam, local politicians and club representatives. Now firmly settled on council land, the RSL is hoping the monument will rest in peace in Lawson Avenue. More than a hundred people were at the village today to witness Mrs Chadwick unveil the plaque to officially celebrate a new stage in the retirement village. Stage two of Iris Court consists of ten one-bedroom and ten two-bedroom self-contained units. It costs around $40,000 to move into a new unit, with $30,000 of that refunded when you vacate it. There is a nominal weekly maintenance fee. By the way, they've all been taken. At the official ceremony today, speakers discussed the difficulty facing the aged in finding quality housing and care. And although the Hawkins Masonic Village now gives support for some 270 persons, there is still a drastic need for more accommodation for the aged. This week for a test broadcast, Rima, which by the way is Greek for inspired word of God, has applied for a special interest license to broadcast full time on the FM dial. From Cliff on Radio Rima 106.9 at 11 minutes past 11. And do you feel... Is there room in Newcastle Radio for a Christian radio station? I think so. Uh, there aren't any other stations that I'm aware of that have 100% Christian format in their music and that's exciting because there is a lot of good Christian music around these days which is what we're playing now. In Acts, also presenting 16, interviews and information bulletins, in the non-commercial station relies on membership say, subscriptions and, and donations to and get to air. But according Acts, to Philip Churchill from United 31. Christian Broadcasting, which has Rima under its communications umbrella, faith will carry the station. Some people would say that you're just a group of Bible bashers and that you're preaching to the converted. What's your response to that? Well, my response to that would be, Peter, that uh, uh, we have no um, problem in telling people that we love the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's really what the basis of our work is. But as far as being Bible bashers, um, 
people don't have to turn us on, uh, and they can turn us <coughs> off again with the flick of a switch if they want to. Lakewood Macquarie City Council was one of very few in New South Wales to offer its pensioners a voluntary rate pensions. rebate scheme. That scheme was effectively an extra to the compulsory rebate provided by the state government and councils. It offered the elderly a little more help in meeting the rising price of rates. But now it seems that rebate is about to go. Recently the state government pulled out of the scheme and the council says it can't be able to go on loan. Okay, so, so it would cost it $1.5 million dollars a year. So at last night's council meeting a recommendation was made that the voluntary rebate be dropped. After lengthy discussion no decision was made on the issue, instead it's been held over for another week. But Mayor Ivan Wilsh said like, today, uh, while there are several options open to uh, council, that one we, seems we the most likely the to be accepted. The the it means pensioners will be digging much deeper come rates time. And according to the Newcastle the Pensioner way. Advisory yep. Service, that prospect has alarmed the elderly. A spokesperson today said they'd been swamped with calls from folk claiming to be frightened by such a prospect and saying if the rebate was dropped, they'd have severe problems meeting the cost of rates. But Ivan Walsh says but, uh, while he realises it may be difficult for the elderly, the abuse for the condition it's of the a fact of life they would have to accept. He did respond. admit, though, that the news is unlikely to receive a favourable reception and said a stormy protest was quite on the cards. Tracy Reed for NBN News. Turnbull was at home in this flat at the junction with three male friends just after midnight when his killer burst into the house brandishing a sawn-off double-barrel shotgun. Witnesses told police he was shot in the side of the head by the gunman who fled with a bag containing a substantial amount of money and drugs. The killer was accompanied by another man and a woman. Homicide detectives began immediate inquiries and early this morning they made their first arrest. Well, at this stage we're interviewing a 24-year-old man from Rutherford and he's assisting us in our inquiries. However, after several hours of intensive questioning, that man was eliminated as a murder suspect. He was charged this afternoon with two minor drug offences and granted conditional bail. Late this evening, the hunt continues for the gunman and his female associate. Both well-known drug offenders in the Newcastle area. The male is described as uh, about 180 centimetres tall. That's a bit over six feet. Uh, solid build, short brown hair, brown eyes and extensively tattooed and uh, should be uh, treated as extremely dangerous. The female, as I said again, uh, well known to the police in Newcastle area, about 170 centimetres tall, thin build, fair complexion, uh, she has tattoos on her arms and her legs.